Salutations to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his family and companions, and I am uh, Sheikh Muhammad of the Mirambuka Mosque, and uh, I've been here for the past two years, and Alhamdulillah, praises to Allah subhanahu wa taala, I've been serving the community through uh, different uh, criteria and through different uh, situations and ranging from uh, praying salah to teaching and educating youth and so forth. So that's basically my role that I do every day at the mosque. Firstly, uh, concerning me wanting to be an Imam and what inspired me, to be honest, I wanted to pursue the career of a marine biologist. And uh, what happened was, over the years, being our community in South Africa, in Cape Town, the community that I am from is 99% Muslim, and the Imam was quite an inspiration to me. And himself being a graduate of the University of Medina Munawwara, uh, my father passed away and automatically I took him as a role model. And ever since then, going to the city of Medina to Munawara for the very first time, I in fact really loved my experience with my family. And being there in 1995 was the first time in fact I wanted to stay and even have my parents, my mother at least, leave me behind. My brother was a major influence telling me and influencing my mother to let me return back to South Africa to finish year 12. And I finished year 12 in 1996. And ever since then, from the year 1997, I pursued the career traveling to Egypt, traveling to uh, Saudi Arabia. I even went as far as Syria and so on to try and pursue information, uh, giving me the ability to communicate. And also, uh, this was the major uh, turning point, leaving me from marine biology to actually wanting to be an Imam, uh, a community uh, influential personality, as I said from my role model, uh, Sheikh Irfan. So that is basically why I'm where I am today. <laughs> the role that I play in the community, specifically here in Merabuka, as again, uh, as a youth, I would say at the age of 15, 14, 15, this is where I pursued, uh, where I used to do uh, part-time uh, Hafidul Quran, 
by memorization of Quran. I done this part time going to uh, secondary school and attending the Hafid school, the, the school of memorization of Quran in the afternoons. And this was uh, conducted by Sheikh Irfan. And uh, Alhamdulillah, at the age of 14, I completed the, the Quran. And uh, again, him being my role model, I noticed and I used to try and imitate him in every way, not knowing as time uh, evolved that I was actually going to fit into the role of being an actual Imam. So there was quite a few uh, programs that I uh, dedicated myself to, like being on the community, uh, a neighborhood watch, trying to assist youth, uh, getting them from the street, from drugs, drug abuse and so on. So for me being the Imam, doing this role, I would say I was in a university, but not the university you go to every single day and you have an exam. I was in a, in a real environment and this is what actually uh, gave uh, birth to my experience. So I would say I had experience of the real world before I entered the real world. Normally you always get the advice that the university is only a uh, a place where you should try and develop skills so that you can apply these skills at the uh, point where you actually introduce to the real world. So being the only problem that I face with, with my age, firstly, uh, I would say looks is deceiving with me. If you look at me, you would think I'm, I'm a guy of about 27, 28 years old. And uh, I'm not shy to say my age, I'm 37. And wherever I traveled in the world, Whatever talks I gave or I recited Quran and I would tell people I studied for 12 years, they would, you know, I could actually see them trying to calculate in their mind how old is this guy. Then I would tell him I'm 37 years old. And I think that is always the situation, specifically if you're in a community, in a role of the Imam or the, 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 the spiritual leader of the community, you always get this uh, twist and turns. But uh, it's all part of a learning curve and experience for me. The masjid, firstly, for myself, is the hub or the center point of the community. You know, if, if I may say, if we take the history of Madina to Munawara, the way it is constructed, it has three ring roads. And the reason I'm mentioning this is just on a point of view, uh, literally speaking, that the, universe, the masjid of the Prophet, in fact, uh, is surrounded by three ring roads. And all three ring roads has roads that leads to the mosque of the Prophet So this is indication to say that the mosque is in fact the hub or it is the center point of the community. And the first and foremost important thing is that a person should know that if there is any situation or any problem, it should be uh, directed to the mosque, specifically when it comes to youth and in the society or the situation we find ourselves today. It is not just the Muslim community, it is all communities uh, right across the world that is going through these trials and tribulations, specifically that that faces the youth today is for, if I may say, peer pressure. Peer pressure is one of the things that basically leads youth uh, astray and they don't have chance or time to make up their own mind and their own decisions when they are being influenced by a group of individuals or so on. So for myself, as I said, everything I was pre prepared for beforehand and to be our assistant to the community is that there has to be interaction there has to be workshops, there has to be awareness because the youth must know one important thing that whatever they are going through, there was some point in our lives that we also experienced, maybe not directly, but we did go or we experienced the same situation that they find themselves in. So I, I, I'll give you an example of myself. In 1997, I landed in Egypt, taking into consideration, as I mentioned before, my father passed away in 1995. My mother being a widow, only having a younger brother, my other brothers uh, lived uh, studying in other countries. It was just myself, my youngest brother and my mother. When I landed on Egypt airport, 
I only had 20 US dollars in my pocket. And I never found home for entire year. Asking, I would uh, send the right letters, I would phone uh, whenever I can, when someone phones home, and then I would just say, uh, you know, give a reverse call or something. But for the entire time that I was in Egypt, I never asked my mother to send me any money. So if I may say, the question would be, how did I survive? And all I can say is, I'm sitting here, I survived. I cannot give you the details, but I can tell you, it was $20 I landed with in Egypt, and I survived there for a whole year. So like I say, whether it is difficulties that we experience, uh, financial, or our, our families have left, been left behind, it is something that we can conquer, it is something that we can uh, try to eliminate any type of difficulties or any situation. It is just a matter of us coming closer and interacting with one another. The responsibility of the Imam, firstly, uh, the way I look, I will, I will put this in three points. The first important point is that the community shouldn't think that the Imam is separate from the community. The Imam must interact with the community and the Imam is just as a person as any person in the community is. There are certain things that any individual does. If I take my, my life as uh, uh, being married and looking after kids, it is something that I have to do. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, to the brother, that uh, I even nominated myself to be a football coach because the coach of the football team, he couldn't make it. So there are certain things that I initiate on myself if I see the opportunity. Uh, because of my experience, uh, as a service to the youth and the only only under nine years old uh, soccer team so basically I just uh, went closer and I uh, decided to assist the best way that I can and the second thing I would say that the community puts lots of pressure on the Imam and it's not something that's happening from yesterday it's happening over the years and I'm not going to say it's unfair but I would say that we need to engage, we need to interact, and we need to let people realize that the Imam himself, he has normal functional duties, taking his kids to school, uh, seeing that they have family time, all these things where people, for example, like me, if I just finish the, the prayer of any, any, any salah, any wakt of salah, the, the, even salah of fajr, if I'm walking out of the mosque of Salah al-Fajr uh, and then I have someone asking me a question, uh, for example, Imam, are you uh, available to give me advice concerning uh, a certain matter at home? Do you have 10-15 minutes? And most of the time I would say I give him the 10-15 minutes. Uh, if I give you just an example of one of the things that I do during the day. Two weeks ago, it was, it was something that basically I'm somebody that I like to experience things that I do not have record of, like, you know, you have a diary, you note down everything, and you have a, a set um, a schedule. Now, this specific day, I had nothing in my diary. I was told the morning at about nine o'clock, my father passed away. I went to the house, I arranged the funeral. When I came to the mosque, we, we done the funeral uh, at 2.30 after the funeral procession. I was sitting in the mosque, someone walked in with a baby and they said, Imam, can you give the baby's name? And I gave the baby's name without having a, a pre-booked schedule. So I gave the baby's name. Thereafter, someone phoned me and said, Imam, is it possible? I know it is the last minute. Uh, would you be able to marry my son? And this was after the Salah of Maghrib, which again wasn't part of my schedule. I said, do you want to do it in the mosque? Do you want it at home? They said, no, they've arranged everything already, but they didn't get, have an imam. So I just put myself in and I went and I done what needed to be do, uh, needed to be done. And that is why I'm saying that there is certain things, I would say, uh, even concerning advice to marriage couples uh, with these uh, domestic violence involved. I get calls 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock at night and a dire straits and I respond and I go and I give advice and this is why I say that uh, 
I cannot have my phone put off. I cannot uh, say, you know, uh, like for example, I always make the, I always use this as, as a means of humor, where I say, I've come to Perth for the first time, I'm an imam, and I get one day off. And an imam, he cannot get off because uh, we have to perform salah five times a day. So, in the modern age we're living, the imam today must have a day off and he has family time. And even if I have family time, or the day I have off, there's always something that I have to do concerning this and concerning that. So, I would basically say, that is the role that the imam plays in every situation. It is not easy, it is challenging, and it's also very tiring. But uh, the purpose we're doing this, again, we do this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we, 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 we ask just a simple thing on behalf of myself from all imams, not just in Australia, but also that people must realize that the imam himself also has a personal life and things to tend to as important as they are doing what you want.